Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome. Uh, I'm Barry Rabe. I'm a professor here at the Ford School and the director of the sponsor of today's event, Close Up, the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to have all of you with us and very, very delighted to be able to uh, welcome uh, our team of colleagues who have been working on this project uh, for some time, a presentation that will be made by George Fulton, and then we'll be transitioning toward uh, Q&A uh, issues. But let me begin by introducing George, who's certainly known to many of you and has really played an extraordinary role in a number of arenas, including illuminating a range of issues concerning the Michigan economy and the future of Michigan economies over really a number of years, a, a tremendous uh, public service. George is the director of the research seminar in quantitative economics, holds a number of other roles. He's joined today in co-authorship of this report by Don Grimes, who's the, associ the assistant director of the Center for Labor and Market Research. Um, they are two of three co-authors of a report which Close Up is releasing today, and you're going to be hearing more about it in a moment, called Transformation of America's Metropolitan Area Economies. This is such an interesting time to be thinking about the future challenges and issues of urban political economy. If I understand it correctly, this started initially as a project comparing Detroit and Pittsburgh, a smaller direct comparison, two very interesting political economies, Rust Belt systems that had shifted, but has now become a much larger project with far more than Detroit and Pittsburgh in it, although both of those are there, and really stretching over quite uh, an extended period of time. So this is a very, very rich analysis. We will turn to George for the overview and then uh, allow uh, for, for questions and answers. We will follow our standard format. Uh, which is to invite you to submit questions on <laughs> note cards that are being distributed or have been distributed. Uh, we do this in large part to make sure that the voice is picked up for, for videotaping and the like. So begin to think even now about questions that you would want to raise. And my close-up colleague, Tom Ivaka, will be uh, working with me to sort through some of those questions as they come in. And also, Tom will be also offering a couple of additional questions uh, as well. With that, Delighted to welcome George Fulton. George. Well, good afternoon. Uh, and thank you for that. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, first, I want to thank Close Up uh, for the, its funding of this project and also for arranging uh, can you all hear me for arranging uh, this uh, this uh, event today, and also the uh, the office of the provost kicked in a few funds, and so I want to thank I thank them as well, and uh, uh, welcome. Uh, so I, I first uh, I want to uh, acknowledge my co-authors as as Barry already did. Uh, uh, first, we have uh, Don Grimes, who's sitting right here, and uh, after I'm finished, he's going to answer all of your questions. <laughs> and then the uh, third author is Yuan Li Zhu, uh, and he, he was uh, uh, the technician in this paper, and he has moved on to uh, Ford Motor Company, still there, I think, right? Yes, yes? okay. And so he's not, not with us, he's not with us today. I just, I want to do also uh, thank Jackie Mary, Murray for editing the paper that is on the working paper that's now on the, uh, the close up website uh, for all the layout and for these uh, really pretty slides you're going to see today. So, the title of our report is uh, Transformation of America's Metropolitan Area Economies Lessons from Four Decades. And uh, before, I, before I go into that, I wanted to show you a cartoon, which I thought was relevant. You see? Oops. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I spent, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I paid you enough. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, uh, so I spent the, I spent the, the last hour uh, trying to get this on, on, on this show, well, uh, but I, uh, I'm technically uh, not proficient here, but I thought it was relevant. It shows some guy that has just got clubbed over the head with a, uh, 
with, with a, a, a sledgehammer. And the guy who's, who slugged him is this real brutal guy with a shirt on that says, January. And the guy is just coming and ready to turn around the corner, and he doesn't see a similar looking guy carrying a sledgehammer that says, February. <laughs> And I just wanted, it, 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 made me, uh, it made me think that I really do need to thank you for coming today in this weather. And uh, also, if this Club E is a metro area, is getting clubbed in the prior period, prologued to getting clubbed in the next period. So we're, 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 we'll, we'll see, we'll see in the presentation. Uh, so just before I get into it, uh, I, uh, I want to tell you a little bit uh, uh, about me. When I started uh, my career, uh, I talked to a very esteemed colleague. Uh, it was not a colleague, actually. He was an academic at another place. And he said to me, you know, I was trying to figure out what to do professionally. And he said, well, you get one, everyone gets one good idea in their life. And whether you're successful or not depends on whether you recognize it and cash in on it. And so I'm still hoping I, my one good idea is still coming. But uh, if, if I did have one good idea, I guess it is uh, to do uh, this economic research on metrop local and regional and state uh, economies. And of course, uh, I was advised then, actually, to not do that. It wasn't by Paul. But, uh, and the three reasons were, well, it doesn't have any cachet. The national is much sexier. Uh, two, no one's ever going to care about regional stuff. And number three is you're going to spend your whole 80% of your career dealing with data issues and constructing data. Well, only one of those three turned out to be true, and that is the, the data issue. <laughs> uh, so I just want you to keep in mind today as uh, we go through this that data issues were really a major issue in this study. We spent months on it before we even looked at our first equation. and. Uh, it's why many of the concepts that might make sense to you, and some of them that you've recommended to me uh, to explain economic success in these localities, are not in our models, because uh, they didn't fit our strict measurement expectations. So I just wanna I wanna start start by that. Um, um, so in this study, what we, uh, the questions, uh, we look at the uh, questions of what leads metro uh, economies to function the way they do, what makes some of them more successful than others, and what policy handles, if any, can improve their profiles. And the primary tool we use is econometric modeling analysis, and I will, uh, I think, by and large, make that accessible to, to everyone, everyone here today. Um, so let's, uh, let's start by uh, talking about what I think uh, the innovations in this study are, and then I will get into the results. Um, the first thing is that uh, we extended the database for metro areas to 40 years, 69, 1969 to 2009. And that's much longer than is typical for small economic regions. The data limitations in this stuff are so severe when you're analyzing these small economies that inferences on the effectiveness of economic drivers and policy handles are often drawn from very narrow time intervals that will not reflect all the behavioral relationships outside the period. So we said, no, we've got to go, we've got to go with longer periods, that's one thing. Uh, and so that means the data restrictions have to, be, have to be dealt with. So we expended really a great effort to expand the time range of our data. And uh, this involved 
so, uh, ensuring that you had consistent metro area definitions over time, because they change, uh, and we made sure that they were consistent. Um, we spent a lot of time in Paul's library looking up some of the old stuff and copying numbers out of books, and you might remember that's how we did it back, back then. So um, then the second thing is uh, we want to take advantage of the longer time period of available data to segment the estimation period into sequential subintervals, and I'm going to come back to that one in a minute. Then we made a considerable investment in assembling new series for variables that we judge to be promising economic drivers. Uh, for example, we individually hand-coded two million plus records on patents, one by one, and almost as many on crime rates. And those are just two of the variables. Uh, so that was, a, that was a huge investment, and you're always hoping that that'll pay off. Um, the fourth thing is we wanted to look at spatial differences among select regions of the country. Okay, are things, do things look different in our region than they, than they do in the nation? And we focused our, our attention there on the Rust Belt, which we defined as the Midwest and Northeast uh, regions of uh, census regions. Okay, and then, due to my friend Paul Courant, we, uh, we recognized that our models wouldn't fit all of the metro areas well, what he called the tyranny of best practices, when we assume that we estimate these things over 366 metro areas, then assume that all of the favorable uh, statistical uh, assumptions are met, you know, random residuals and so on, and so that it applies to all of them. And uh, he said, well, why don't you, uh, why don't you see if that's, if that's the case? So uh, we did an analysis of the residuals to identify the metro areas that showed the least confirmation to the general model. We found some interesting stuff. And so uh, we'll, we'll get into that in, in, in this talk. Uh, now just going back to the second point, uh, we estimated these equations for two sequential 20-year subintervals. So we had 40 years of data, two sequential 20-year uh, subintervals, and we wanted to ascertain what the changes in the uh, what changes in the economic relationships could be identified between the earlier and the later periods, uh, well, while still avoiding uh, the criticism of having intervals that are too too short. So we used our, our 20 year. Our curiosity on this was motivated by observing how volatile these small economies were uh, over shorter segments of time. That is, any one decade is not prologue to the next decade, okay? So the guy that got clubbed on the head when he turned the corner isn't necessarily there got a guy waiting for him. Um, and that I can show you here on the next slide. Uh, these are metro area rankings based on the change in personal income minus transfers per capita. Okay? And I want you to note in particular the movements in the first two areas that are listed. Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Midland, Texas. So over the whole period, Bridgeport was first in the change in income. But in 69 to 79, it was 73rd, then it was first, then it was second, and then in the last decade list, there it was 347th out of 366. Okay, another one is Midland, Texas. 14, 2, 356, 248, 4. Okay, and part of that, of course, is the, uh, is, 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 uh, the energy market. And so, um, if you look at the others, uh, there's more stability, uh, a little more stability, but they still, they still move around uh, quite a bit. So, that's, that's what we started with. 
And then if you look at the paper, this, is all, this analysis is all followed by a fairly uh, extensive literature review. In fact, one of my colleagues that read the paper said, there's too many pages on the literature review. <laughs> but, uh, and so, so I'm not going to run through that. I, I thought as a strategy here is I'd go right to show you our estimating results. And then when I'm done, I can show you in a table how they compare with what the previous literature said to the extent that uh, the variables were there. Okay, so let's start with the model. This is our general model specification. Uh, we use two dependent variables, which is change in y. One was specifically real dollar change in personal income minus transfers per capita. And the second was the percentage change in total metro area employment. The independent variables that you see there are included at the beginning of each of these intervals, and the dependent variable uh, measures this change over the time interval. And so, of course, now the trick is to get proxy measures for each of those variables that are in the parentheses uh, in this equation. And what I'm going to do is I take you through a few tables, you'll, you'll, you'll see what, what those are. So let's start, and I'm not going to hit everything. Um, there's thousands of regressions in this project. Um, but uh, let's, let's, hit some, let's hit some high points. And so this is, the, this is the chart we designed so that I didn't put up all of these things with coefficients and standard errors, and you can't even see them from the back. Um, so I hope, this, I hope this helps. The way this chart is laid out is um, we have the variables uh, in the first column, uh, and then in the next two columns are the results for our two income models, early period and late period, later period, and then the last two uh, columns are the, uh, are the early and later periods for employment. And the sign of the coefficient is uh, in, in the cells. And uh, the purple cells indicate that uh, it was significant at the 5% level uh, using, uh, using uh, p-values. And the asterisk indicates that that particular uh, variable didn't uh, go in that equation. OK. Um, so. If we look at uh, the first line, which is the initial income levels, you can see that they have a positive effect on the change in per capita income over the period. But in fact, the, the uh, effect has dwindled over the two periods. Not only is it less significant, the coefficient is, is, is smaller. Okay, so, uh, so that's uh, an example. I think a more interesting one here is the uh, initial population size in one of these areas, uh, in these areas, uh, and you can see that its effect on, on per capita income is positive. We interpret that as uh, agglomeration economies in large areas, uh, but this effect seems to be uh, dwindling over time as firms have a lessening need to congregate uh, for production efficiencies. So uh, let's go to the industry structure. I'm not going to do all of these. Um, in working uh, in many, many, in several decades, let's say, of working on uh, these regional things, I think the most fundamental answer, uh, the most fundamental thing that I've learned is the makeup, the industry makeup of local economies is integral to their economic success patterns. Okay, and for instance, the, you see the, mine, the mining share there variable, and you can see that the, in the income equation, the signs flip, uh, and that reflects the vagaries of the oil market. So you can see if you just uh, estimated a decade, you could get some misleading results on that. Um, if you look at manufacturing and durables collectively, you can see that that is uh, a negative sign, which shows the, the negative impact of 
manufacturing sector over time. And I think one of the, actually in many ways, one of the best studies in the literature on this just looked at one decade, which was the 1990s, and they found a positive sign on the share of manufacturing because that decade happened to have a little resurgence in manufacturing, and they made a deal of that. And I think that uh, 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 was misleading. Okay. Uh, let's see uh, what else we have here. Okay, uh, um, just a couple others. Uh, it's interesting that the, the uh, share of finance and insurance is always positive, always significant, and a few other studies that use that variable, it's always positive and it's always significant. And I think that reflects the higher value service sector orientation there. And then of course you see the, uh, the growing influence of health services. And, you know, whether that's going to continue is, is, is a topic for, for discussion. Um, but we are the only ones that I know in this literature that actually uh, looked at that particular industry. Okay, now, I think uh, the demographic results uh, were in our results were largely puzzling or uninteresting. You know, I'd like to just click past this one, but... <laughs> uh, the income employment results for the foreign-born population actually suggest a disproportionate numbers of lower paid workers in this group, although it's not significant. What's interesting, by the way, in the Rust Belt, it's the other way around, uh, higher paid. Um, the most puzzling result in this entire study was uh, the positive and a significant effect in the uh, later period on the share of the population in poverty. So more people in poverty in the initial period led, led to uh, higher growth in income, higher employment. So, you know, this is research. We don't hide anything here. Uh, this could be a statistical problem. And we uh, realize that, although we, we hashed this around quite a bit. Um, if, we're gonna take, if we're gonna say, yeah, that's the correct result and we're gonna try and think of something, which we, you know, we can think of something, uh, uh, we can posit that higher poverty levels initially prompted more activity in programs to assist the poor. Having said that, I think that seems to be a bit of a, a, bit of a stretch. Then we have the share of the population 65 or older, and it's in there to represent the lower labor force participation rates of that cohort. It wasn't a factor in our model, and by the way, uh, it wasn't a factor in any study that I could find that looked at it. So I guess, I guess the, well, I won't make a comment about older people. <laughs> About to especially, join. especially, I'm about to join them. Yeah. Uh, so, now let's look at the innovative environment here. Uh, and an innovative environment is increasingly, increasingly viewed to be an important driver of economic growth. The argument is that scientific development promotes economic development. So, in terms of our new measures of patents granted. Uh, two groups that stand out is, are IT patents and industrial patents. And the impact of the industrial patents uh, strengthens in the later period. Uh, so uh, that, was, uh, that was encouraging and uh, we spent considerable effort on putting that series together so we were glad that, it, that at least it seems to have some, some benefit to the model. Now the most disappointing result in our work was this uh, research expenditures. Um, it's actually university research expenditures. <laughs> I'm glad you're still not the provost. <laughs> uh, now, do I believe this? Uh, uh, no. Um, 
I think the fact that we have educational attainment, which you'll see in a minute, and the granting of patents into our equations could be confounding the results here. The interesting thing to me is other studies that have looked at this with other combinations of variable have also found mixed results. But it's really difficult to believe that the research and technology creation functions of universities, if they're isolated and measured properly, do not result in enhanced regional economic development that otherwise would not occur. Now, of course, in a place like uh, the world-famous University of Michigan, a lot of these benefits are, are not just contained in Washtenaw County, so they, they, they spill out. Okay. Uh, now here's, I think, an interesting, an interesting slide. These are the variables related to policy decisions. Uh, Gerald R. Ford School, we should take a look at this. I think the two most compelling variables in this set are educational attainment and crime. Educational attainment is measured by the share of the population with a bachelor's degree or higher. Now, we tried other measures. Uh, I know it's not all about just bachelor's degrees and that, but this one really, this one really is the one uh, that, that stood out. Our results are consistently positive, but only, and, and by the way, in other studies, they're always positive. Um, uh, but in our study, only significant for income. And I think that's consistent with the general rationale, which I will put out here that more educated reason, regions are becoming more economically successful because they're becoming more productive. And productivity, of course, is a double-edged sword. Now, the crime rate uh, is one of the strongest variables in our model. And in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for, as, from a research point of view, because we spent an enormous amount of time putting this together. And I think it emphasizes the importance of deterring crime, especially considering that the effect on income was actually larger over time. Now, we thought, well, um, maybe uh, we also had, uh, we put together a series on violent crime as well and property crime. So we thought, well, maybe we should test out the violent crime and see if that, that's, that's even more significant. And uh, we just ended up settling on, on total crime uh, as a measure for various reasons, which I won't get into now. But we did, we did certainly look at, at violent crime. Uh, now, we get into, now we get into the more controversial variables. Uh, state and local government tax as a percent of personal income. And so this is an age, age old problem in uh, state legislatures and that. Whenever I, we go and do testimony twice a year, it always comes up. And half of the people say, we should be doing more of this, and the other half say, we shouldn't be doing this. And I say, I don't have any information <laughs> on it. <laughs> uh, it turns out that the effect of state and local taxes on the uh, change in income and employment was usually negative. That's true of other studies too. Uh, but I have to say, uh, talking to people that, are, that specialize in this, which obviously we don't, um, that this uh, representing this is really fraught with complications. It's very complicated to put a really good tax burden uh, number together. So I do, have to, I do have to give you that caveat, uh, but that's, uh, that I will. Okay, we'll skip over the next one. No, we won't. <laughs> we included in our equations a dummy variable for location in a right-to-work state. So is the metro area in a right-to-work state? If the metro area crossed border uh, state boundaries, we assigned it to the state uh, where its major city uh, resided. So we had to do a lot of fiddling. Um, so this is a dummy variable with a value of one representing 
the presence of the legislation. So if the legislation's there, it's one. You can see that this variable was usually positive and it was significant for both income and employment in the later period. We interpret this variable more generally as representing a more general business-friendly environment rather than more narrowly as a union avoidance measure. And indeed, if, 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 if you're going to argue it as, as a union avoidance measure, you might expect a negative sign on, on income and a positive sign on employment, which is the argument uh, as I understand it. I think on this variable, this one, this one is one, uh, it's so politically charged and one really needs to be very careful about, about this because uh, it really does take some time after the enactment of the legislation, I think, for the effect to actually be reflected in results like this. So if one were going to dig deeper here, and we didn't, but if one were to go dig deeper here, I think it makes some sense to go back and look at the tenure of this legislation over states and take a look at the states that have had the legislation in place for longer periods of time and see, uh, try to determine uh, what effect those have on, on economic outcomes because these things don't ha happen instantly. A right to work state, okay, next day, uh, you know, everything's positive or uh, Employment's positive, income's negative, or, uh, uh, you know, all of the arguments. Um, so I, I just, I, I leave with those thoughts on it. Uh, the other thing, of course, that's, that's become uh, increasingly important is the economy's becoming more global. And the connectivity to the outside world has become more important. And we measure that by air traffic. We looked at freight as well, didn't work as well, and uh, we find a positive and significant effect on employment in both periods there. And uh, we'll come back to that when we look at the rest of the literature. Okay, how about amenities? Um, I didn't think they were so funny. <laughs> the uh, the problem is, and we, we, we chatted with uh, Barry and Tom about this before we, uh, we, we came here, is that you have uh, person-made amenities and you have natural amenities. Well, personal, uh, person-made amenities are very difficult to measure, especially if you're trying to get a measure for 40 years over 366 metro areas. That's consistent and good. Um, now. The, uh, but that hasn't stopped people, of course, from trying to look at what they call natural amenities. And until our study, I could find no study that did anything different than putting in the July temperature or the January temperature or both temperatures. In our case, we, we got more mileage out of looking at the, uh, the difference in the two and arguing that more moderate temperatures are, are, are attractive and you can see uh, all the negative signs, uh, but there is a positive sign for employment at the end. Um, and I think that's just, in my view, uh, too narrow a, a measure of climate, but I understand why people do it, because you can get it. Well, we stumbled across this natural amenity scale. Uh, it's published by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and it looks at natural amenities in six different dimensions, okay? So do you have water? Do you have mountains? Are your, are your, are your, summer, your summer temperatures, your, you know, and, and, and it, had, it had lots of, lots of things that I think we would all agree are attractive. And so we put that in, and indeed uh, uh, it, uh, it worked in the employment equation uh, it was positive, positive amenities in the earlier period and positive uh, but uh, not significant in the second period and uh, one wonders perhaps uh, if those kind of natural amenities are becoming less important for people 
that are, are, are businesses that are seeking locations, but that's, that I don't know. Uh, so let me see. Now, what I want to do uh, quickly is how do we line up with previous studies? So I kind of summarize these pages and pages of uh, literature review. Um, so what, what I did here is put a brief summary table together. This isn't in the paper. Uh, it is non-rigorous, but I thought it would be helpful in the discussion. In the first column after the variables, uh, P stands for expected positive sign, N for expected negative sign, and the question mark for uh, it, the fact that it was indeterminate in the, in the pri in, in, uh, a priori in the literature. Okay? The second column indicates whether the variable was usually significant. NA stands for no presence in the literature or very little presence in, in the literature uh, other than our study. Uh, the, the next column is, uh, indicates whether the variables in our study were significant. Earlier means earlier period. Later means later period. Usually means usually. And, uh, and then, uh, then I have some notes. So, uh, so for the initial period population size, for, for example, uh, in a time interval, our results are usually significant. It indicates a positive effect on employment change. As I told you before, that represents agglomeration economies and a negative effect on employment, which suggests that larger metro areas are more prone to declining employment over time, although that seems to be weakening over time as well. So uh, let's go to the structure. Uh, and I think all I want to uh, point out here is that the, uh, the share of health services, which isn't in any other studies, uh, appears to be coming more prominent over time. Uh, often variables besides manufacturing and finance matter, and in these studies that's just about all you get. And of course I've talked about mining. Uh, is it, uh, where's mining? Oops. Uh, that's in other, and uh, often these share variables are significant. So we have uh, mining in for the energy uh, metropolitan areas. We have military for uh, those that uh, have large military bases, and those, those all matter in those areas. Okay. What about, I think what's stands out in the next slide is the contribution of our patent variables to represent innovation, especially for IT and industrial patents. And as I said before, that's heartening because we spent so much time putting those together. Now we go to the policy-related variables. Uh, my first impression here is that among these policy-related variables, there are a lot of consistencies in, uh, of the findings among previous studies and our study. Uh, and I think the second thing is the largest contribution, I think, here for our study is the crime rate variable, which is strong in our model and not present in other models. And again, that was heartening for us because we spent a lot of time putting that one together. And then off to the amenities again. Uh, we have our more comprehensive measure uh, than the traditional measure of, of temperature with the national amenities in, uh, scale uh, from the agricultural department. And uh, you can see uh, how we can, no one else has that one. And, and then there was one study because I thought a question would come up, what about corruption? I don't know why that would enter your mind about <laughs> local economies. But someone thought about this, and so they somehow had a measure for it, and they found that there was a weak, there was a, it, there was a negative relationship between corruption and economic uh, outcomes, but it was not significant. And so I'm not, I'm not touting that. I'm just, I'm just saying that's, that's, that's what the study said. Okay. 
Now, the other thing, uh, one other thing we did, as I told you, is we repeated this entire estimation effort for two subregions of the country. One is the Rust Belt, which we defined as being made up of the Midwest and Northeast census regions of the nation, and then the rest of the country. And our purpose there was to explore whether there were important spatial differences in our results. Fear not. I'm not going to step through all of these results. They're all in the paper. Instead, I'm just going to make a few summary observations. Uh, first, we did find that there were sufficient differences in national and regional results that there is benefit in estimating a regional equations when the region is a primary interest. And then we also found that there were effects of some policy-related variables that were consistent across geographies. Uh, the consistent effects for income growth across these geographies were supporting education and deterring crime. And the consistent effects for employment growth were providing an innovative environment for industry, enhancing airport connectivity, and being good stewards of the natural environment. Okay, so um, now, now we go to the, the Paul-inspired analysis. And so uh, what we did next is investigate the pattern of the residuals generated by our four national models. In other words, the earlier and later periods for the change in both real per capita income and the change in employment. And we did this for two reasons. Uh, no, we did it for three. Uh, the first one was to try to further validate the model, which a lot of people don't do. And the second was, of course, to identify those metro areas that did not conform well to the fit of the general model. And the third reason is Paul told us to do it. And so, you know, that's what we do. Uh, we don't know of any other study of this genre that did this, which in a way implies that these models, those models there are thought to be well behaved with random errors. Well, when you're estimating the economic behavior of hundreds of metro areas across the country with the severe data limitations that are inherent, it really is unlikely that the models will be so well behaved. So the question is, where are the outliers? What didn't work so well? And is there any organized pattern to these outliers that can give us a clue of what we might be missing? Okay. So I'll show you the graphical residual analysis of all four models, but I'm really just going to focus on uh, no, no. Is there, no. Uh, uh, I'm just going to focus on, on the last one. In all of them, the residuals are plotted against the estimated change in the relevant dependent variable. And the circled numbers you see in, that, in the graph are associated with a key that lines up the outliers. These are more than two standard deviations from the mean, and uh, the, 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 the legend gives you the metro area names. And I'll, I'll show you just one example shortly. Uh, okay, got to say a technical thing. Um, the residuals for the 366 metro areas are studentized, which means the residual value is divided by an estimate of the standard deviation, a standard technique in the detection of outliers. So I'm sure I preempted lots of questions there. Uh, a general observation is that the model fits the income change variables better than the employment change variables, at least in the sense that there appears to be no systematic pattern in the outliers in, the, in both income models. In both income models, the outlier residuals are evenly distributed in sign, and there are no clear geographic patterns. Okay, here's the, uh, here's the plot of the residuals for the later period. Uh, in the in change in income, and now I'll move to employment, and this is, this is the results for the employment change in the earlier period. And these are a little different story, which makes them more interesting, but also introduces more concerns. We find two tendencies in these employment models. 
first, most of the outliers are positive, uh, meaning that those metro areas are outperforming in employment what the models understand. And second, most of the outliers are found in the south and west regions of the country. So how come? What's going on here? What are we missing in these areas? Uh, so I'm going to go to the later period, which is the one I'm going to look at a little. Here, all 10 of the outliers, as I defined it, that we identified, all 10 are, are located in the south and west regions of the country. And so here they are. Look at number one, Paul. <laughs> uh, if someone wants to know what's going on in St. George, Utah, I, we have an expert in the room, and so I'll pass that question on to him. Uh, now, we didn't in this study try to uncover all that was going on here, okay? At some point, you got to stop. Uh, we see that as a topic for future research. But we said, let's try to make an initial pass at trying to account for some of the strong employment growth in these areas that isn't being picked up adequately in our, in our model. So here we hypothesized that this rapid growth could be due in part to lesser geographic or legal restrictions on growth in these areas. And here are the data that we came up for, these, for those measures. Okay. It turns out that there are data available for 11 of the 21 outlier regions that we identified in either employment model. The land use variable that's in the third column is a z-score, where smaller values, including negative values, represent looser regulation. So this is stringency of land use regulations. And we expected if it was loose, that was more opportunity to grow. The uh, other column uh, is the land availability variable, and that's the percentage of land, divided by 100 if you like, that's accessible to develop. So you can't develop wetlands according to this measure. You can't develop land that's on steep slopes. And so that's, those, are, those are ruled out. Okay. It turns out that these, the, those hypotheses these hypotheses are fairly consistent for the seven areas that you see on this first slide. They basically have loose regulations and available land. Okay? Miami at the bottom has a negative residual, but it is appropriately combined with strong regulations and little available land. Now the hypothesis works less well uh, for the uh, four areas on this, uh, for the four areas that are on this slide, particularly the last two. Okay, so we're only getting part of the way uh, to understanding this. One other possibility, of course, in these models is that we're dealing with outside or exogenous shocks that are fairly significant in these regions, and you wouldn't expect them to be in the models. For example, in Laredo, Texas, which is a border, is a town right on the bo Mexican border, the introduction of NAFTA in the 90s gave this area a significant shift in the arm. Another example would be the introduction of casino gaming in the 1970s. Gave quite a boost to Atlantic City, New Jersey. And remember, these are relative, we're not talking about the nation here, these are relatively small areas. And I can give you other examples. Uh, so some of the large misses might not be due to internal modeling shortcomings. And I'll just leave it at, at that. Okay, so let me, uh, after talking away here, let me consolidate what I think some of our main findings are. This is the point to pay attention if you haven't been. <laughs> the uh, strongest indicators of the well-being of a metro area which are also found in previous studies, are the initial conditions in the area, the industry structure, educational attainment, business-friendly environment, and airport connectivity. 
We added the crime rate, the innovative environment, represented by industrial and IT patents, and amenities associated with the natural environment. The other thing we wanted to stress here is the impact of economic drivers can change over time. That was the whole idea of doing these segments and following them through. And see if all of these are at least intuitively pleasing to you. And these were all that we pulled out of the model. The shrinking effect of agglomeration economies. Does consolidation for production, is it as important as it used to be? The growing influence of health services. The increasing importance of industrial innovation. The expanding negative impact of crime on regional income. Those all rest well with me. On the research method, a couple of points. Uh, I think estimation over longer time periods is important if you're going to interpret these uh, coefficients correctly. Uh, more and better measures of local economies are called for. And it's important to identify metro areas that are outliers to the estimates. Okay, finally. Does public policy matter on this stuff? It's sort of the bottom line, right? And I'm standing here at the Gerald Ford School of Public Policy and going to give my opinion on that. Uh, I, I've been coached prior. To, no, I haven't. <laughs> I said, say what you want. Some people say no. Economic success, and here's one, two arguments. Economic success rests with decisions made by individual firms based on their products, process, and location decisions reflecting personal preferences of company leadership. Okay. Second thing, second one, it's right out of the literature. Urban growth is largely based on idiosyncrasy, fate, and history. What's our view? Our view is that although many of the drivers of metro area economies have longer time horizons to affect change, there is an opportunity to move economies onto a more favorable long-term growth path with sensible policy-induced change. What are some of these sensible things? That's how I'll close on. Such as educational attainment, business-friendly environment, airport connectivity, crime deterrence, innovative environment, and amenities associated with the national environment. So I guess my conclusion is all of us in this room are relevant. Okay. <laughs> We're all validated. And so good night and good luck. <laughs>
and uh, that maybe we're entering a period that the growth in the Detroit area is going to be a little more positive than people expect. All I can think about is back when we were presenting our long run forecast to SEMCOG in the late 1990s, we had a forecast for their performance for looking out 30 years, I think, and uh, our results were a lot less favorable than what your uh, members expected. They were thinking that the economy was continued to boom. They had just gone through the 1990s, which were where the metro area of Detroit was in the top quartile of all metro areas in the country. The unemployment rate was extremely low. They thought things were just going to continue. And when we presented results that were, I mean, continuing to grow, but at a lot slower pace than they expected, they were unhappy. And they thought we were wrong. Of course, then in the next 10 years, things turned out to be even worse than we were expecting. And then a few years ago, we were presenting another long run forecast, revised, uh, into the Simcog region. And we had growth turning around in 2000 and starting when we were presenting this in 2010, 2011. And everybody was sitting there thinking, nah, we're going to go through another future that's been just like the last 10 years. And of course, as things have turned out, things have gotten better. So uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic. I think things people have to realize, take this longer term perspective, as George emphasized, that look at what's happened over 20 or 30 or 40 years and not look at sort of something that's going to happen over the last 10, which can be misleading. So I think that overall things are going to look a little better for the next 10 years than they have. Of course, that's sort of maybe we get to the, 19, uh, the 2020s and maybe we'll get into a down cycle again. But <laughs> it does look like uh, things are going to be uh, doing better than the 2000s. Yeah, I think, I think our mindsets tend to be auto-regressive. I remember uh, uh, an Outlook <coughs> conference dinner in the late 90s, and we had a speaker, and he said the business cycle was dead. And he took on everyone in the room, and he was quite adamant about it. And, uh, well, you know, the late 90s, and then... Uh, uh, now we move forward to after the first decade of the aughts and when we were turning out forecasts that uh, said the economy's turning around in Michigan, uh, we got trashed. How can that be? It was terrible in eight, it was terrible in nine, how can it be better? And so I think uh, uh, just, just to elaborate on Don's point, also, it's the only question we know how to answer, so we're just dragging it on a bit. <laughs> uh, well, then I'm going to throw a tough question at you. No. Uh, <laughs> no uh, technical question. Uh, regarding state and local taxes in, in the model, uh, do you also control for state and local expenditures? Uh, one would expect the, the partial relationship uh, to be negative for tax but positive for spending. Yeah. we. Uh, we don't have that in the model, but that is, that is certainly a good point. Um, you know, obviously there are people that uh, argue, and I think argue correctly, that uh, firms and people are attracted to places that uh, are going to offer them uh, good services. And some of those services have to be paid for by tax revenues. And so I think that's, uh, uh, so, so I, th I think that is the 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 other the other side of the other side of that coin. And that may explain why the tax variable is not significant, because obviously some of that also creates a positive effect through this government expenditure. And so that essentially, uh, all other things equal, maybe lower taxes. But if lower taxes pay for lower services, then you don't get as big an effect as uh, some of the theoretical. I mean, theoretically, it should have an negative effect, but you have to control for everything else, which means what do you do with the, with the money? Or if you don't have the money, what you don't do with it? Uh, the study found somewhat of a mixed impact from natural amenities such as bodies of water and, and so on, as you uh, discussed, uh, in terms of job growth in the Rust Belt. Uh, the question is, for Michigan, uh, given, given the, uh, the growing importance of water in the future, uh, do you think that the Great Lakes will have a, a larger impact in the future than perhaps they've had in the past in terms of economic growth for the state? And if so, uh, are there any arguments there for more policy action to protect the lakes? Uh, 
Now, since I didn't put the Rust Belt questions up, that question must come from someone that has read the report. Um, I think I think the uh, uh, and then Don can follow me. I, I think I think the uh, Great Lakes are one of our biggest assets, uh, for our biggest natural asset. I think, and I I think uh, in in the future it's going to be even uh, a more significant asset. As long as we don't trash it, we've got to be good stewards here. I, I think that the, the uh, natural amenities are one of the comparisons you have to take outside the region, especially the Great Lakes, because essentially, remember that was a regression of the Great Lakes uh, in the Northeast Midwest region. So a lot of sta you know, states uh, are, uh, have the natural amenity of the Great Lakes as part of it. So that's where you want to look. The natural amenities are something where you're trying to compare a broader geography. Um, and I think the other thing, going back to your, actually your first question, I think what's also important is to look at how the coefficients are likely to become more significant over time. You could sort of see some things that were trending, as George said, upward, that were more important in the more recent period and less, in, uh, uh, less important in, uh, in the earlier period. So there's some possibility that that actually represents sort of this, this change. So looking again, going back to the next 20 years, agglomeration seems to matter less, for example. Uh, crime seemed to matter uh, more in an adverse effect. Um, education attainment seemed to matter more in the, uh, in the current period. That seemed to be picking up effect, in other words. So I think that's the other question, is try to identify the, the trends and what variables are going to matter more over the next 20 years. We, we, we continue to answer that question to avoid <laughs> the other questions. <laughs> Uh, to what extent is uh, the right to work dummy variable picking up on how poor the South was relative to the North in the late 1960s and how the wealth gap has narrowed over time, perhaps due to factors besides right to work? Um, I think that's true um, uh, to some extent because you go back to 1929 and you see a narrowing of the, of the uh, income gap by states. Um, I think the other aspect was that the industrial structure in the southern states uh, particularly uh, benefited uh, in the latter period. Uh, you know, the uh, expansion of military activity, for example, the presence of those military bases, which were uh, helping some of those, uh, most of the military bases are located in the south, and of course that helped. Oil production, at least through <laughs> 2009, tended to be located in southern states, uh, Oklahoma, Texas. Um, so I think there was some, Louisiana, some tendency for the South to benefit from some of the uh, industrial structure issues in the, uh, especially in the second latter period. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, yeah, okay. I, I'm, I'm not as sure. Um, I guess I just point out, ultimately, it is a dummy variable. And so it's, it's not a fine, it's not a fine tuned, it's not a fine tuned measure. Um, and so we really, it was important for us in this study, um, you know, we both have preconceived philosophical positions. Some of them are not always the same, actually. <laughs> uh, but we really wanted to come in here and ask what, what the data told us. And, and I, think we stuck, I think we stuck very closely to that. So I just want to add that. So we're not advocating a position. Uh, the next question is, uh, does Richard Florida have anything valid and significant to say? And if so, then what? <laughs> I've forgotten about Richard Florida. Um, we think so, but we can't prove it because a lot of his stuff would deal with the sort of the man-made amenities issues. Um, and we couldn't, we couldn't construct sort of a consistent man-made amenity uh, metric uh, going back in, the, in, in time over metro areas. I think he's also looking at, a, at an issue of, the, uh, of cities versus sort of suburbs. He's looking at specifically at cities as opposed to the, the metro area. Uh, and we were, of course, using metro areas as opposed to central cities. I think that's an important measure to try to put together, though. I think that's, I, I'm really very intrigued by that. But the thought of spending four more months 
constructing data at the moment <laughs> has reduced my motivation. But I think it's a, if, if someone here wants to do that, that's cool, let me know. <laughs> Uh, just to follow up on that question, this is one thing that we uh, discussed a little bit. Uh, Close-up just recently put out a report uh, from the Michigan Public Policy Survey that found that local governments around the state of Michigan are increasingly uh, pursuing placemaking, which is fairly along the lines of what Richard Florida uh, discusses, creating places where people want to live, work, and play with man-made amenities, whether it's nightlife or art museums and theaters and so on. Uh, can you speculate at all what you think uh, if Michigan is uh, kind of limited in the natural amenities that we have in terms of days of sunshine in the winter, whether man-made amenities may be able to uh, close some of the gap? Well, just remember one thing about the man-made amenities. There's a lot of people who are reading Richard Florida's book, Ground the Country, and his papers. And so it's going to be, if they matter, and if everybody is trying to you know, follow his prescription of creating this uh, place, uh, it, that, that you're not going to gain. This is a, this is a zero-sum game in some sense. And so uh, you know, the problem is that essentially if you create uh, a more positive environment in, in Michigan, but so does, uh, but that also happens in, in Illinois and Chicago or Seattle or Boston, you know, you're not going to gain anything and it's not going to show up in our data. So, it, I mean, in that case, it would be the counterfactual is you'd lose more, I guess. You'd lose ground. So that's the problem with trying to, if everybody follows the same policy prescription, um, you don't, uh, you're not going to change the results. <laughs> well, I do think that higher amenity areas can experience faster growth, and I think uh, a number of them have. But I think there has to be some level of value-added development that's required to, re to realize that growth. I don't think people are going, or I don't think there's a great flow to places that are just nice. I'm turning to you now because you're the amenity person. So two quick comments on that. Maybe. Yes, please. One is allowed to speak from here, John. Um, one is you found strong evidence of one, which is yes. crime. Yes. Crime is, and you got the right sign? You got the right sign yes, on both your variables? Yes. And that seems right. Yeah. So it was it's very true significant. For, true for crime, then it can in principle be true for ballet. Um, yes. Perhaps at a smaller, um, smaller magnitude. Um, the other is with amenities. Um, they have opposite effects, or they can have opposite effects on, on income and employment. So you'd expect nice places to actually have lower wages because people are perfectly happy to be there. Um, and, therefore, and, and that makes them attractive for more employment. And that seemed to me to be also close to consistent with the amenity variables yeah. you had. Now, we're yeah. not at the level of granularity of yeah. Richard Florida amenities. But yeah. that they can make a difference, that there are compensating wage differentials for nice places, I think that's pretty well established. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this uh, follows up. Uh, Chicago uh, is certainly one of the uh, draws for Michigan uh, youth uh, graduating with BA degrees. Uh, this may be out of your um, your area, though, but uh, let me just throw it. Uh, what five things, or let's say what three things, would you recommend to Rahm Emanuel that he do to improve Chicago's economy? Well, Don lived in Chicago, so I'll toss that one to him first. It is really cold in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> in the winter. <laughs> yeah. I'd do something about that. Yeah, the, the, okay. the, uh, That's the weather there is, is uh, not so nice. Um, it's also very expensive. So if you can find a, uh, your, uh, you, you may be a net loser in real terms, in terms of your wage uh, power if you're, you're buying uh, mm -hmm. activity. But people do like Chicago, so it's a good place to visit. Expensive place to live. What was that? Repeat that again. What five things? Uh, oh, God. Next? What two things, <laughs> what's, what's including thing? weather. What's the most yeah. important thing that Rahm Emanuel can do for Chicago? Can he do that, though? What? Make it a less expensive place to live. Yeah, the other thing that maybe, and, and I, it's not in our paper, 
transit may matter, actually. Um, mass transit stuff may matter. There's some work that sort of indicates that there may be more benefit to that in terms of attracting young people. More than ballet, which they <laughs> don't attend. <laughs> Uh, the study found a positive impact on employment growth based on uh, the economy share of agriculture, uh, given that um, uh, Michigan uh, agriculture is a strength in Michigan. Uh, are there any uh, policy implications statewide? I, I know the data is, uh, is not state-based, uh, but this is a strength for the state of Michigan. Uh, did these findings uh, say anything to policymakers about the agricultural industry? If you ask me and when a go to Lansing and do testimony to the legislature twice a year and have been doing this since 1991, if there is one question we get asked every time, it's about agriculture, purportedly the second largest industry in the state. And I just remember your quote is a, one of the second largest industries in the state. <laughs> Along, yes, health care and yes, we could, yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, you answered it. Well, the, 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 you know, the, the question, you know, agriculture is important. It's actually done well in the state of Michigan. Um, it's probably going to affect smaller metro areas more than suburban Detroit metro area. Um, you know, what are the, how do you enhance agriculture? That I don't know. I mean, Remember, we're talking about urban areas here too, and I know you know that, Tom. But, but the, uh, yeah. But it also depends on what you define as agriculture. Yes. I mean, is it farming? Is it urban farming? Or, or uh, is it like food processing? Which we is do, in non-durables manufacturing. We, we do pretty well in food processing in this, yeah. in this state. So, I, you know, part of the problem of answering these agriculture problems and uh, questions is I never had a very good definition of it. I mean, uh, some people say people who shelve groceries in grocery stores are agricultural workers. And it doesn't strike me that they're agricultural workers, but um, anyway, I'm going far afield. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the last question is about uh, immigration. Uh, some previous studies have found that uh, immigrants tend to um, be more entrepreneurial than native-born um, Americans. Uh, but this study uh, found a mixed impact or um, uh, less of an impact in terms of uh, employment growth uh, from the foreign uh, share, of po uh, share of the population uh, foreign-born. Uh, Governor Snyder certainly is um, making a big push for uh, immigration in Detroit. Uh, does your study say anything uh, to state policymakers about uh, trying to boost uh, immigrants to Michigan? Governor Snyder's talking about what he's called skilled immigrants. It's going to be higher paid immigrants. Um, and that's what he's trying to attract. Uh, you know, People are worried that they, uh, this is more competition for jobs here. I will say um, that in our long-term forecasting, it's really very clear to us um, that there are going to be uh, fairly significant labor shortages in, in the economies that make up the U.S. And I would not be surprised if at some point uh, these regions got very competitive to try to get these skilled immigrants. Um, how you do that, I mean, uh, I'm a Canadian, I dealt with the immigration authorities, and uh, boy, he's got to have some tricks up his sleeve to, <laughs> to deal with those people. <laughs> they almost booted me out. <laughs> you know, so anyway, Don. You, you have some thoughts on that, I know. You know, um, this is just all immigrants are the same. And the one thing I've seen in other studies with, with data is that there's actually a wide variation in the educational attainment of, of immigrants. In, in Michigan and, and in the metro Detroit area, immigrants are actually much better educated, the foreign-born are much better educated than the native-born population in some of your southwestern states where a lot uh, more, more the Mexican uh, migration uh, the undocumented Mexican migration comes in, you, you get a less educated uh, workforce 
and has a that I think is where you begin to see the negative effect on the income uh, side. And if you saw the results for the Great Lakes area, you actually saw a positive effect on the per capita income. Yeah, yeah. And I think the that that's, yeah. yeah, I think it's a, you could f tie immigration better to the per capita income stuff than you can to the employment uh, numbers um, in, in their mix of educational attainment and, and how they affect the wage, average wage in the community than, than on the employment stuff. So I, would, I think that was just sort of a bad, bad fit on the employment stuff. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one last question, if we have uh, anyone from the audience. They want to go home. <laughs> or okay, eat. Final question. Please. So, you know, I'm, I'm not in school here, I'm just a person, but um, in the real estate business, and, and so okay. we're always looking at sort of these macro trends. And yeah. You know, there's a, a lot of compounds that start to occurring in terms of migration to the south, which was the reversal of maybe migration to the north for, you know, during the 20s and industrialization of the United States, or the migration west and things of that nature. But if I look at cities in terms of what really drove them, and I don't, I don't know if your study really addresses it, is there, it's almost like there's sometimes there's maybe an individual that may sort of create that city in the sense of Detroit, obviously Henry Ford. Ford, but you can look out into Seattle and say maybe Bill Gates, yes. or you can look into, so it's almost one person that creates an incredible economic driver which then spills out on the rest of the stuff, and I, I don't know if any of the research you've done touches on that at all. No, it's certainly true in the early 1900s, and we could list six others, some of them in Michigan, uh, that were, were created because of that. I don't, I don't see that as much, as much now. Um, but no, our, our research didn't, didn't really address that. I mean, I obviously can't predict that, but it's something that I sort of noticed. Yeah. No. Uh -huh. I don't know who's the guy in St. George, Utah. <laughs> That's driving their country. They're the, they're the outlier on our employment growth. <laughs> I don't know. There's one person in this room I know stayed at the a hotel in St. George, Utah. So he. I do research all over the world. I know, I know, I know. Um, I want to thank Tom, Don, and George, and also invite all of you to join us out in the Great Hall for a reception where you can talk about St. George, Utah, or anything uh, that you like. Uh, before closing, would only note that, um, remind you that the full paper is indeed posted on the Close Up website which gives you a chance to follow this conversation and look directly at that. Uh, the information on that is on the back of your program. With that, would note that a preview of coming attractions, there'll be two major events that the center will be sponsoring in March. One is, it was about this time last year, that we worked with colleagues in, the, in, in urban planning uh, to launch a book called The City After Abandonment, which raised questions very pertinent to certainly Detroit, but a number of the jurisdictions of when you have population and economic contraction, what happens with land? One issue that emerged from that was discussion of Youngstown, Ohio, which many have held up as a possible model for Detroit. We'll actually have a panel conversation that will build on what we did last winter and talk about lessons from the Youngstown experience. Then we'll also be joined uh, in late March, March 25th, I believe, by Kevin Orr, emergency manager for the city of Detroit, who will be taking a break from his very busy schedule. Uh, and joining us in that case, not here in Weill Hall, but in the Michigan Union Ballroom. So that's a preview of things to come. Before we close and head out for refreshment, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>